All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 2020 edition of the ICTS Summer School on Gravitational Astronomy. Uh, I hope all of you are following the public health advisory and, and staying, uh, staying safe. Um, due to the ongoing pandemic, we are experimenting with a new model for the school through um, online lectures. So I first wanted to thank, uh, on behalf of the organizers and the ICTS, uh, all the lecturers for agreeing to put in this extra effort, and for um, all of you for uh, joining the school remotely. I hope that uh, with a little bit of effort from all of us, we can make the school as effective as our uh, regular schools. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce our first lecturer, Professor Harold Pfeiffer. Professor Pfeiffer is a world-leading uh, numerical relativist. He leads the numerical relativity group at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in, in Potsdam, uh, which is uh, also called the uh, Albert Einstein Institute. He is um, also a professor at the University of Potsdam. Earlier, he was an associate professor at the University of Toronto before he moved back to uh, Germany, which is his uh, home country. Professor Pfeiffer has made uh, major contributions to numerical relativity and the associated uh, gravitational physics. He's um, one of the leading architects for the spectral Einstein code, which is the most uh, accurate numerical relativity code for solving the two body problem in GR. And beyond his uh, primary focus on uh, numerical simulations, he's also interested in, it, in, in their applications to gravitational observations, the development of normal, uh, uh, novel uh, numerical techniques and, and visualization. His work has been widely recognized. He's a recipient of the Frederick uh, William, uh, William uh, Bessel Research Award by the Humboldt Foundation, and is an associate fellow of the Gravity and Extreme Universe Program by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, the CIFAR. In addition, uh, Professor Pfeiffer has uh, held several important uh, organization roles uh, within the LIGO Scientific Collaboration and the LISA Science Team. So uh, with this introduction, let me invite uh, Professor Pfeiffer to give the first lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to, to speak. Um, I'm very sorry that I cannot be in India. I would have looked forward to uh, visiting India again and, and ICTS in Bangalore, but uh, perhaps another time in, in the future. Um, so let me actually begin sharing slides. So uh, a little bit of introduction in terms of slides and then uh, we'll switch over to the actual lecture. So the, the, the primary goal here is to solve Einstein's equations for the merger of two black holes, uh, like you're seeing in this movie here. Um, this is a movie for the very latest announced gravitational wave discovery of LIGO. Um, you see the two black holes, this time clearly unequal masses orbiting about each other. The movie has zoomed out in order to highlight the gravitational waves. And the inset in the corner still uh, shows you the black holes as they are orbiting each other. The, in this particular simulation, the big black hole carries a spin, as indicated by the white arrow you see in the corner. And the spin direction and the orbital plane direction is changing during the movie, during the inspiral, um, because of general relativistic coupling between orbital angular momentum and uh, angular momentum of the black hole itself. Uh, the gravitational waves carry away energy, the orbit gets tighter and tighter, and now we are close to the two black holes actually merging into one. Um, a common horizon forms, and uh, the remnant black hole initially distorted, then settles down to a quiescent black hole. And the burst of gravitational waves around the time of merger propagates away and leaves behind uh, just quiescent space time afterwards. So the, these, these are the type of events numerical relativity these days is focused on. And um, the primary reason still to do numerical simulations are to support gravitational wave astronomy. 
Um, um, I hope many of you have seen this, this iconic image from a paper, from the discovery paper for gravitational waves. The top panel shows the gravitational waves as measured by the LIGO detectors. The middle panel in gray again shows the gravitational waves as measured by the LIGO detectors. And in red and blue, uh, numerical simulations of two coalescing black holes in uh, full general relativity, the type of simulations I'm going to talk about between today and Wednesday. And <clears throat> uh, the importance of these numeric simulations for, for the LIGO discoveries are manifold. Uh, the numerical simulations influenced the construction of the search templates, which are used to identify putative signals in the data stream. And the numerical simulations are essential for, to estimate the parameters of the black holes. Um, like this very first detection, the black hole masses were about 30 plus 36 solar masses. We wouldn't know this without uh, the numerical simulations. And they are also essential to learn about the nature of gravity, whether general relativity is the right theory of gravity or not. Very simply put, in order to test general relativity, in order to compare its predictions with nature, you must know what the predictions are. And for the actual merger phase of the two black holes, the numerical simulations are the only means to actually um, scope out and investigate the implications of general relativity in sufficient detail. Um, numerical relativity roughly splits into three different aspects. And I decided to structure my three lectures around these three different aspects. So today's lecture plan is uh, the formalism behind numerical relativity. Uh, answering the question, how does one turn Einstein's equations into a form that can be solved by supercomputers? Tomorrow, we'll be talking about the numerical methods that are used when solving Einstein equations on supercomputers. And on Wednesday, I will be talking about results. What have the NR simulations accomplished so far? And what else remains to be done? So this is a summer school. So I'm going to switch to low tech in the, uh, for the rest of it. Um, in part because I was hoping to actually write on the blackboard while, uh, while being in India, uh, which is much more fun than giving slides, but unfortunately also because I didn't have uh, the time to, to uh, translate all my, my handwriting notes into uh, fancy PowerPoint slides. Along the way, I think Achieve already told you so, please do ask questions. And also, please do ask uh, the Zoom buttons. So there's, there's one for hand up if you want to ask a question. Uh, there's also buttons to, to indicate that you would like to me to proceed faster or slower. Um, please use these tools. Um, they are important feedback. Otherwise, I'm flying quite blind here, and this is not uh, a nice idea. And you can also use the chat window to type in questions. Uh, Achieve will be monitoring it, and he will interrupt as necessary and, and, and make me change, go faster, slower, explain, uh, and answer questions as necessary. Um, to start this, uh, let me ask if I thumb up, thumb down, whether my sound is OK. OK, I've also turned off my. Um, video screen, screen to share some bandwidth, uh, to, to um, save some bandwidth. Uh, so let's actually get going in earnest. Um, as I said, our goal is numerical relativity in, in my set of three lectures. And the reason we need to do numerical relativity is to explore uh, sufficiently generic situations of 
uh, in general relativity. If one has enough symmetries, then all the numerical stuff is necessary because you can just use the analytic solutions uh, like Schwarzschild, Kerr, uh, the two important black hole solutions, or the Friedman Robertson Walker cosmological solution. If there are small parameters in, in the system, then one can deal with perturbative solutions. For instance, one can perturbatively expand general relativity around flat space, around Minkowski space. Um, that gives rise to gravitational waves, where the metric is written as, um, the full metric is written as the Minkowski metric, G mu nu, plus a small perturbation H mu nu, uh, where this H is much, much smaller than one. The same type of, of perturbative solution can be done for individual black holes and leads to the quasi normal mode analysis of black holes, where you're writing um, the full metric as, say, a, a Schwarzschild black hole plus a small perturbation. And again, you can solve for the small perturbation with a simpler set of equations than for the GR. Another important uh, parameter is, is velocity. If velocities are small, one can do the so-called post-Newtonian expansion in the small parameter V over C, and that leads to the in-spiral waveform templates for, for the LIGO detectors. And, and the description of the early in spiral force. Or yet another small parameter that comes up is when the mass ratio of the two black holes are uh, very different from one, if one black hole is much smaller than another one, at that point then can, when one can expand in the mass of the small body, and that goes under the technical na name of gravitational self. So in many situations, we actually don't need full numerical relativity simulations. But whenever all these uh, specialized situations don't apply, if you have strong field gravity, if you have a highly dynamic situation, like at the merge of two black holes, and if there aren't any symmetries in the game, again, like if you have two black holes orbiting about each other, perhaps even with spins that are pointing in generic directions, that is then the domain of numerical relativity. With the most important um, application these days, um, the coalescence of two compact objects, in my case, two black holes, in the other lectures in this uh, school, also neutron stars. As I said, the two objects are first heavily orbiting about each other at some large distance. They're getting closer and closer together. Um, eventually, they're merging, forming a deformed black hole, which then settles down to a quiescent black hole. And all of this gives rise to the um, typical waveform. It's oscillatory during the in spiral, first long wavelength, uh, short amplitude, then shorter wavelength, larger amplitude. Uh, the biggest amplitudes to near merger, at least for equal mass systems, for very unequal mass systems, the peak amplitude actually is before merger. And then an exponentially decaying ring down phase at the end. So, um, numerical relativity can answer the question of, of what's going to happen at all. Does this um, process unfold as I've just described or otherwise? Uh, what, is the, um, what is the outcome? What is the mass of the final black hole? What's the spin of the final black hole? Is the final thing a black hole at all? Or is, say, the weak cosmic center, the, the cosmic censorship conjecture violated and we form a uh, naked singularity? And um, perhaps the most exciting piece right now are the gravitational waves that are emitted by these objects. Um, 
I'm focusing on black holes, but black holes is not everything. Um, Numerical relativity can also deal with, with matter, collapse of stars into neutron stars and into black holes, um, a rotating neutron star that might form a black hole in the accretion disk. Um, there's also something called critical phenomena in general relativity that has nothing to do with uh, black holes and astrophysics at all, but it's actually really cool stuff. Um, it kind of begins with the question, what happens if you have either matter or gravitational waves that are initially widely dispersed, but that are moving in such a way as to um, concentrate in a small area in space. At that point, you can ask the question, what's going to happen? And you can ask this question in terms of, say, some amplitude that describes how much stuff you're starting out with. If you start out with very little stuff, well, what's going to happen is that the stuff comes together and it will disperse again. And so no black hole is going to form and life looks good. Everything is, is approximately in flat space. On the opposite extreme, if you're starting with extremely large amplitudes of stuff and you're compactifying it into a small area in space, a black hole will form with a certain mass. And now at this point, you can ask the question, what's happening in the middle? If you dial down the amplitude in this black hole phase on the right hand side of this diagram, well, the black hole is going to become lighter and lighter. On the contrary side, if you're starting at the very small amplitudes, making the amplitudes bigger, well, at some point, something else that dispersal must happen, otherwise you will never get to the black holes. So what's happening in the middle? And the question is actually quite complicated and was explored in the 90s and people have been coming back to it occasionally and trying to refine the answer. Um, fundamentally, at one magical critical amplitude here in the middle, um, a naked singularity forms. And that's one of the, the really cool things one, one could actually scope out and explore with numerical relativity, that um, the cosmic censorship conjecture can be violated sometimes. Once you go to higher dimensions, um, you can also do a lot of other neat stuff. Um, for instance, in four dimensions, black holes must always be spherical objects. Whereas in higher dimensions, you can have black holes of a lot of different topologies. For instance, in five dimensions, you can have a black string. And uh, these objects also collapse. And what happens when black strings collapse to something else was explored with numerical validity. So primary goal, of Mercury relativity today uh, is, the, is the coalescence of compact object binaries, black holes and neutron stars. That's also the main focus of the entire summer school this year. But uh, as I also tried to point out here, there's also other interesting things you can do with numerical relativity. Let me switch over to a very simple and uh, history of the early part of numerical relativity. Uh, the subject actually goes back into the 1960s. Harold, you have a question from Apratim. Um, hi, can I, uh, can I go, go ahead? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, in the previous uh, slide, uh, so th there can be some configurations where you can have uh, uh, the formation of naked singularities but uh, has there been any study where so if you if you uh, go on collapsing a system you can reach a stage where quantum gravity can be important 
So has there been a study to see uh, whether if you have quantum effects, um, the formation of the naked singularity for such configurations can be delayed a bit so that you can have the formation of the event horizon before the naked singularity forms? That's a good question. There have been very few studies. The, the only ones I'm aware of are certain models of uh, cosmological collapse, that you can have an oscillating universe that expands, collapses down to singularity, and then re-expands again. And there have been some studies by Neil Turok and others uh, that indicate that you can actually pass through the singularity. The difficulty in all of this is that there is no known theory of quantum gravity, so it's really difficult to say what's going to happen. I would, ex I would agree with you that the naked singularity would, might very well be um, removed by quantum effects, but to actually be certain, we would need a full theory of quantum gravity, which doesn't exist presently. Uh, sorry, just to follow up. So uh, what, what I was asking is if you can just say add in higher order terms and see if it gets delayed a bit. So I know it's not a uh, full theory, but to see that whether if you, if you keep on adding higher terms, whether in such configurations where you previously see naked singularity, which, whether that can be delayed or not. That's a very good question. I don't know the answer. And I'm not aware of anybody having done this. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Okay. GR started actually in the 1960s. 1964 was the first simulation of what turns out to be two wormholes connected to each other. And they went on a 50 by 50 uh, grid point grid for a total of 150 time steps. That was Hahn and Lindquist. In the 70s, there were the first attempts to do head-on collisions of two black holes by Smar and Epley are the first names connected there. In the early 90s, uh, Matt Choptwick did his pioneering work on critical collapse, the ones that I just described in a few words. And starting the mid 90s, um, the first large scale coordinated attempt was made to simulate binary black holes in a project called the Binary Black Hole Grand Challenge in the United States. Um, the goal was to simulate two black holes in, in all situations, with spins, without spins, orbiting eccentric orbits, merging, and that way compute all the waveforms that are needed for the LIGO detectors. And after several years of very concerted efforts, um, the outcome was that it was realized that the problem is actually much harder than anticipated, for some of the reasons I'm going to explain later. And what was actually accomplished during that time that was that a single black hole could be numerically evolved while it is moving through the computational grid by a few Schwarzschild radii. So, there's gross progress, but a lot less than was hoped for. Then, in the 90s and in the 2000s, there have been immense amount of improvements to all aspects of numerical relativity. Uh, to the formulations, how you actually write down the equations in order that computers can solve them. Um, understanding of the constraints, I'll talk to you later what it means. Coordinate conditions, I'm using the word gauge here, which is the technical term. Um, the numerical methods have also been improved quite a bit, especially adaptive mesh refinement was put in. And also on, on the initial data, on, on how you actually start out a simulation of two black holes in order to actually have two black holes in there. Then 2005-2006, the interesting things happened. In early 2005, um, Franz Pretorius was the first person to put all the pieces together 
into a working code that actually was able to, to simulate the last few orbits of two black holes around each other and its merger. And he's using an approach that goes under the name of generalized harmonic approach, which is one of the ideas I'm going to describe at the very end of today's lecture, hoping I, I, I get to it. And a few months later, in late 2005, two different groups, one at the Goddard Space Flight Center and one at Brownsville University of Texas, um, pioneered a different technique to solve black holes, uh, the so-called moving puncture method. And in 2006, a little bit later, a collaboration came around, the so-called SXS collaboration, standing for simulations of extreme space times, um, with our spectral method code to also solve Einstein's equations with different numerical techniques. Everything up here has been using finite differences. And what these words, finite differences and spectral and discontinuous colorting means is, is the topic of tomorrow. Then, so this was 2005, 2006. And then luckily there was 10 years time to actually explore the binary black hole problem in enough detail with the numerical codes to be ready in 2015 for the first detection of gravitational waves. As already mentioned earlier, um, the search templates have, were built using numerical relativity. The parameter estimation was based on input from numerical relativity. And, and all the tests of GR uh, require numerical relativity as well. If you don't know the answer, you can't compare the measurement against the expected. Um, this slide I already talked about earlier, about the three different pieces of numerical relativity. First, to reformulate the Einstein equations such that they can be put on supercomputers, then to develop and implement numerical codes, and then to actually do the cool stuff, to use the codes to explore the physics and black hole simulations. So, Let's switch over and become more technical and talk about how one goes about to rewrite Einstein equations in order to be able to put them on computers. The goal of the whole process is actually quite straightforward. We want to find a space-time metric, G mu nu, that satisfies Einstein equations. Namely, the Einstein tensor, capital G mu nu, computed from the metric little g mu nu, must either vanish or it must be equal to uh, whatever matter sources you have um, in your space time. Neutron stars, radiation, neutrinos, whatever might be floating around. Um, I leave the matter to uh, Ian Hawke's lectures and so I'm only worrying about the easy case of having zero on the right hand side of Einstein equations. You also want to do this in an evolutionary matter, manner that somehow a state now can be evolved and can be turned into a state later. That we can start with two black holes at large separations and have them orbit and see what happens later as they spiral in and merge. This now versus later is actually not trivial at all because in general relativity, we don't have a preferred time coordinate. All we've got is a full four dimensional manifold with space and time all mixed together and one can use any coordinate system one, one chooses and pleases when one is talking about general relativity. So the first talk goal is to take this, this generic manifold M that doesn't have a preferred time coordinate and put it back into a form that has time and space split 
and where the generic Einstein equations actually look like they could be evolutionary in nature and where you could actually begin thinking about we have a state now and that state evolves into the future. This goes under the big name of 3 plus 1 decomposition. And this being a, a summer school lecture, I'm going through these steps in, in a lot more detail than otherwise, because this is material you usually don't see, um, and you usually only see the fancy um, movies at the end of the day. So there's quite a few steps involved in, in getting this 3 plus 1 decomposition going, so, so let's go through it. Starting with our manifold, the big box here, um, one introduces a time function. This is a function from the manifold itself to the real numbers. And <clears throat> it associates a real valued time to each point in the manifold. Um, such that hypersurfaces of constant time, say the lowest surface here might be all the points where this time function equals the value T1. These hypersurfaces, I shall call them sigma t, must be space-like. So we have one space-like hypersurface at t1. At some later time, this might be going into some later surface t2. And at some even later time, we might have some surface t3. And these time functions and their constant time surfaces, t1, t2, t3, they will be what we call surfaces of equal time. There is still a tremendous freedom left in how we choose this time function. Once we have these time functions, however we have chosen them, we haven't chosen them yet, we just assume they exist, um, there's a lot of extra structure that now follows from these time functions and that we are now going to elaborate and work through. It starts with the normal one form to these constant time hypersurfaces. And like always, the normal to a constant a surface of constant value is given by the gradient of that function that has the constant value on the surface. Um, the normal one form is going to be time-like because the surface sigma t itself is assumed to be space-like. Um, we can now normalize this thing by simply computing a normalization fun factor alpha. And that way we get a normal, a unit normal one form and a unit normal vector to our hypersurfaces. And the fact that these things are unit expresses themselves in the fact that their inner product with each other is equal to minus one. So a little bit more uh, details and nomenclature. This function alpha that normalizes things is called the lapse function. It will show up later again. This minus sign that I was sneakily putting in um, into my definition of unit normal actually makes the end, makes the unit normal future pointing. Where future pointing means that if you take the gradient of the time function and contract it with the normal, you'll find a positive number. So <clears throat> time is actually increasing in the direction of them. Okay, <clears throat> so we have a normal to the hypersurface now, but we also have a lot of extra structure within each one of these hypersurfaces. So let's take one of these hypersurfaces and let's see what we can do with them. So here's my hypersurface. I still call it sigma t. One can first define spatial vectors 
spatial tensors. Ah! Getting there. Let me get my colors all sorted back out again. Sorry for that. Spatial tensors, by definition, are objects that are tangential to the hypersurface. And tangential means that they don't have a component orthogonal to the hypersurface. And that means any contraction with uh, the unit normal is going to vanish. For a vector, a vector is called spatial, like this V, if its contraction with the unit normal vanishes. A tensor, like this one here, is called spatial if its contraction with any index with the unit normal vanishes. So starting with the contraction of mu, of mu all the way to the contraction of the last index, which are called mu in this example. So we have objects that are intrinsic to the surface called spatial tensors. We can also project any space-time object into the surface as well. And that works basically <clears throat> as you would project um, three-dimensional uh, 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 vectors around in Euclidean geometry. If I start with a generic vector like this V that has a component within and outside the hypersurface sigma t, you can compute its orthogonal part, V orthogonal, as an inner product of here's a typo. Uh, you can compute it as as um, as a project. You, you can compute its its normal piece by a contraction of the full vector with the unit normal, a, a dot product. And that way you can write um, the orthogonal component as, let me fix this table here. That's the beauty of being here on a, uh, doing this live and not just with slides. You can split it in an orthogonal piece and by subtracting off the orthogonal piece, you can arrive at the tangential piece. Spelling all this out in index notation, um, you can write this parallel piece as the full tensor, v mu, which you can write as delta mu nu times v mu. And you can write this projected piece as the projection um, multiplied by the normal vector again. At this point, you can now um, separate out the, the Vs, and you end up with a matrix product where you have a, a matrix called, I, I'm going to call gamma, multiplying the full space-time vector. And this gamma thing here, is uh, what's called a projection operator. Um, projecting a full space-time vector, V, into its spatial part, V parallel. Harald, there is a question from Saman Roy. Saman, yes. go ahead. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. yes. Thank you. So, uh, in the previous slide, uh, as you mentioned that the we are taking the slices at different times. So, I mean, is the time spacing is uniform? No. So, how the, we are the, the, time time? Space, the time spacing is so far totally generic. There, there actually is no sense of uniform in space time, because in order to be uniform you need to be able to relate points to each other. And if you're in a generic curved space, that's not possible. So 
The slices could be all different strange ways so far, as long as the hypersurfaces are all spatial. We will talk about how to actually get the spacing later on. Okay, sure, thanks. Okay, so we, we now know how to turn space-time objects into spatial objects. And this thing, this gamma, is not only a projection of a vector, it also is, and that's important, it's going to be the spatial metric. So the spatial metric, the scanner object, um, is, can, be viewed, can be shown to be the spatial metric because what we can now do is we can take the space-time metric, the G, and we multiply it by, with two projection operators to get the spatial metric projected into the hypersurface as well. And if you go through the math, it's a few lines basically using that n times n is minus one, you'll end up with um, a certain particular form for this thing, which happens to be precisely the same gamma mu nu we had as projection operator, except that both indices are lowered. And it's this lowering of indices that turns the original delta mu nu into the g mu nu of the gamma with the lowered indices. So with this gamma, we can now do a lot of different things. It is the spatial metric in that it can be used to measure distances without within the hypersurface. It is the projection operator that turns space-time tensors into spatial tensors. And it also raises and lowers spatial indices. For instance, if we have a vector with lower index mu, space-time vector, however, assumed to be spatial, If we raise if, ah, if we want the index lowered, but we have it with some upper index we knew upper, the way you lower an index is always with the space-time metric. If we now plug in the three plus the, the gamma the gamma form of the space-time metric, then you will notice that the second term drops out because we have said that uh, V parallel is a spatial tensor. So we have the V parallel mu, mu dot n equals zero. And what is left is only V parallel upper mu times gamma. So spatial vectors and tensors, you can raise and lower indices either with the full metric G or with the spatial metric gamma. Having gamma now, we can also define the full differential geometry within the hypersurface itself. So this starts out with having to define a spatial derivative that works on spatial tensors only. So to define this thing for scalar functions, we are defining it as the space-time derivative, and then multiplied by the projection operator, where the projection operator removes any time component of our space-time derivative. If you have objects with indices, like here, a vector, again, the spatial derivative is defined as the full space-time derivative. And then each index is being multiplied by one of these projection operators. Um, for nomenclature, this is the space-time covariant derivative. And the d mu is the spatial derivative we are going to have. 
um, one can check the spatial derivative satisfies all the conditions you have on derivative operators. It's nice and, and well defined. Having it, we can next define spatial curvature tensors using the commutation relation that defines the Riemann tensor in general. So this equation now, using the spatial derivatives on the left-hand side, defines our spatial Riemann tensor on the right-hand side. And I'm putting the little three on top of it to distinguish it from the space-time four-dimensional Riemann tensor. So this equation must hold for all spatial uh, one forms omega. And the second defining property is that the spatial Riemann tensor multiplied by, a, by the normal must be zero, that the spatial Riemann tensor is spatial itself. Once you have spatial uh, Riemann, you can contract it to get the spatial Ricci tensor and the spatial, spatial uh, scalar curvature. So at that point, <clears throat> we could do, and we're going to do later, the full differential geometry within the hypersurface. The next piece we have, which still comes only from choosing to have certain hypersurfaces, sigma t, is something as an object called the extrinsic curvature. This has to do with how our hypersurface is embedded into the bigger manifold. We could have a hypersurface that's basically flat and has some intrinsic metric gamma. We could have one that is twisted like this, but still has the same gamma. One way to, to do this is to take a sheet of paper uh, with squares on it and just take the sheet of paper and bend it. Just by bending a sheet of paper, you will not change its intrinsic geometry, how distances are measured within the sheet of paper, but you change its relation to the embedding space. The same is true in, in general relativity, just with more dimensions. And the concept of extrinsic curvature is precisely capturing the notion of how one is embedded in the surrounding space. A curved surface is associated with the unit normal changing direction from point to point. And it turns out this can be used nearly precisely to define what is meant by extrinsic curvature. Uh, the extrinsic curvature is given by the gradient of the unit normal. It's symmetrized and it's again projected into the hypersurface itself to arrive at a spatial tensor uh, called k mu nu. If k mu nu is zero, you could view the surface to be embedded in, in as flat a way as possible into the surrounding space. If k mu nu is non-zero, the surface is, is curved in some way relative to the embedded space. One can now show, I won't, but you can look it up in either Baumgarten and Shapiro or in Eric Gopolion's lecture notes, uh, that were both given on the website, that my definition of KU nu is identical to these two formulas I'm giving here. Formula one, um, without the explicit symmetrization on the gradient. And formula two, um, with a lead derivative, of the spatial metric along the normal n. That might sound surprising, but the way to, to visualize this is by looking at small distances 
within the surface. Like here, starting out between the two unit vectors I have been drawn here. If I take this little line element between the basis of my two n vectors I'm, I'm plotting here and move them forward along n, I get a longer vector in green right here in my sketch because of the way I had drawn my surface. And it's the metric itself that measures distances. And so if, as you now move upward here, away from the initial hypersurface, the distance increases between two nearby normals, then this is, can be related to the change in the metric as well. And this is what this last equation down here uh, shows. So we have an extrinsic curvature. And so by now we actually have collected quite a few different objects and I'm running awfully totally out of time it seems. So let me move a little bit faster going forward. 7.30, 8.30, I have, I'm pretty much halfway done I guess in terms of time. What I have not done so far is I have not chosen any coordinates yet. I'm always using space-time coordinates, mu nu, and I have not yet used my hypersurfaces to choose better used coordinates. So let's switch over and actually do adopted coordinates. Let's use our time function as one of the four space-time coordinates we're going to use henceforth. And let's use some spatial coordinates xi, which are not yet specified for the rest, for the remaining three coordinates. So a certain coordinate point here on the hypersurface sigma t will have coordinates t and xi. And if I'm going to the next surface, t plus delta t, Somewhere on this surface, I'm going to have a point that has the coordinates t plus delta t, like every single point on the next hypersurface. But one of these many points will also have the same spatial coordinates xi. So there's a line along which the spatial coordinates xi are constant. And this is the line that chooses that is tangential to the time vector that I have. I have not yet defined. And this time vector can now be split into a component orthogonal to the hypersurface along N and a second component tangential to it called beta. So the time vector can be given by, by this formula here, alpha times n mu plus beta mu. Um, alpha is the same lapse function I already introduced earlier. Beta is called the shift vector. The name comes about because as you go from one hypersurface to the next, um, if you first go normal, then the beta can, uh, is, is shifting your, component, your coordinates tangentially to, be, to, to the new hypersurface. So now we can work out coordinate components of various objects. And life is actually remarkably interesting here. The unit one form um, is given by the gradient of t. t is just a scalar, so I can replace it by the partial derivative. But t is now my first coordinate, so it will be 1 for the first entry and then it will be 0 for the rest. And I still have the, um, the lapse function in front of it. The shift vector with upper indices is, must have 0 in its first component because the shift vector must be orthogonal to the unit normal. And the same is true for any upper zero component of any spatial tensor. It will also vanish because it contraction with the lower and mu is going must be vanishing 
and the lower end mu only has a non-zero time component. So the, the upper metric, for instance, the upper spatial metric is given by a four by four matrix where all the time entries are zero. The next object we can define is, and, and write down the coordinates, is the time vector. This is going to be given by one zero zero zero. And this follows by definition of the time vector as a, a derivative new coordinate point minus old coordinate point divided by delta t. Well, the spatial coordinates are the same. So they drop out and you end up with the one zero zero zero. Having the time vector and the, the normal vector and, and the shift vector, we can write down the normal vector. And now we can, one can also show that the three by three submatrices of gamma mu nu and gamma mu nu are the inverses of each other. That means you can raise and lower spatial indices with just the three by three submatrix gamma instead of the four by four matrix gamma. For instance, beta with lower index i is given by gamma i j times beta with the upper index j. At that point, we have all the pieces of the space-time metric expressed in, in pieces that we have now split, uh, accumulated in the three plus one split. And it turns out you can actually write the space-time metric in this form here based on all the uh, smaller pieces I have introduced. And this leads to a very iconic form of the line element given by minus alpha squared dt squared plus gamma ij, the spatial metric, times uh, two spatial uh, uh, coordinate basis one forms. And this split has the name of three plus one metric or ADM metric. For Arno, Witt, Desa, and Misner, who were the first people who, who actually went through this, this calculation. In addition to this 3 plus 1 metric, we also have the nice property that all spatial objects that we had introduced as four-dimensional tensors beforehand collapse into three-dimensional objects. So for spatial vectors, we can just use the I indices going from over x, y, and z um, for, for any of these objects. Also, the space-time derivative, or the, the spatial derivatives, turns into objects that only have spatial indices and that happen to be given by precisely the forms uh, you know from usual differential geometry if you just had never in included a time coordinate to begin with. So the spatial components of the spatial derivative in our spatial, spatially adopted coordinates are just the spatial partial derivatives um, with a spatial Christoffel symbol correction term where the spatial Christoffel symbols are given by the usual Christoffel symbol formula using the spatial metric gamma ij, as, as always. Similarly, the spatial Riemann tensor that I was introducing as a four-dimensional object earlier, um, if you only take its spatial coordinates, they are going to be given by the usual formula related to the spatial Christoffel symbols. So I should put the threes everywhere here. So everything fits very nicely together, and we are basically um, close to being done with decomposing Einstein equations. The last step now that we have done all our 
uh, preliminary work is to actually decompose Einstein's equations themselves. So I've written them down here again. And decomposing means that I take this expression and I'm multiplying it with, say, two times the unit normal to the hypersurface. That would be the time-time component. I can multiply it with one unit normal and one spatial projection of a beta gamma. That would be the time-space components. And I can multiply it with twice two spatial projection operators. And if one does this, one obtains equations that actually can be written in terms of the smaller objects I was introducing so far. The time-time component turns into an equation that has the three-dimensional Ricci scalar and the extrinsic curvature in it. The time-space component turns into something that has a covariant spatial derivative and extrinsic curvatures. And the time-time, the, the, the space-space component turns into something that has a time derivative of the extrinsic curvature and a bunch of curvature terms on the right-hand side. Um, and there's more geometry terms floating around here. In addition, in these equations, if one has um, matter, like the 8 pi t mu on the right hand side, that will also remain. It will show up in all these um, equations as well. If you're taking the projection with two ends, what shows up on the right hand side is no big surprise. T mu nu projected with two ends. If you take the space time components, then you have the 8 pi si on the right hand side, where the si is, well, no big surprise. It's t mu nu contracted once with an, a normal and once with the gamma. And if you're taking about talking about the gamma gamma components, you have this middle line here that has the two spatial projections of um, this momentum tensor built in. So you end up with a set of equations that looks like this, and that is augmented coming from the definition of the extrinsic curvature by this formula here that gives you a time derivative of gamma ij in terms of the extrinsic curvature and the shift vector. Uh, this formula comes from the uh, lead derivative of gamma mu nu equals minus one half k mu nu. And if you spell out the lead derivative in, in terms of covariant derivatives, well, you get the expression I have written down here as time derivative of gamma. And it also comes along with writing the space time metric in the form. I've already spelled out a few lines above. So this big box is now the, the full 3 plus 1 decomposition of Einstein's equations that goes under the name of, of ADM equation, Arnold Wiesner, 1962. And so far, all of this seems to be looking very, very swell. Um, so let's actually try and talk about this box for a few minutes and see what we have here. Okay, let's see. Uh, plenty of comments. First of all, all variables may depend on both space and time. So everything you're seeing here, extrinsic curvature, matter density, uh, three Ricci tensor, spatial metric, anything can be functions of space and time that, that just change Atomic. The gamma ij and the ki 
look like evolved variables. We have equations here that tell us how they change forward in time. We have equations that give us time derivatives of KIJ and MIJ. The right hand sides are complicated, sure, but it looks like evolutionary equations. So we are moving towards the point where you can specify them at some time t0, and then you can evolve them to some later time. The functions alpha and beta are freely specifiable. They encode the coordinate freedom of general relativity. Recall that I earlier told you that if you have a hypersurface T0, alpha tells you how far away the next hypersurface is. And so by the choice of alpha, you can choose the shape of the next hypersurface, the T1. Similarly, the beta chooses how much coordinates shift between the initial hypersurface and the next hypersurface. So there are these lines of constant xi. And with the beta, you can choose where the lines of constant xi go from one hypersurface to the other one. So the alphas and the betas, they just tell you what the coordinates are as you go forward in time. And conversely, if you stare at these equations, it actually turns out nothing specifies them for you. Nothing tells you what they should be. They show up in various places, like here, like here. Sure, they show up. You can pick them. They, once you pick them, they will determine how k and gamma change. But they only encode the portions of k and gamma that depend on coordinates. Next, we have a set of equations, the first ones I was writing down, that do not contain time derivatives. These first two equations here, they don't have any time derivatives in them. They are what is called constraint equations. They restrict the possible choices of k and gamma at each instant in time. So so you can't just pick any gamma i j and k i j. They have to be satisfying those four constraint equations. You can show then that if at time equals zero, you have satisfied your constraints, uh, the constraints are going to be preserved later on by the evolution equations. So in principle, it should be good enough to satisfy the constraints at time equals zero. And then you can go off and use the evolution equations to go forward in time. So, all of this, at first sight, looks good. Um, you somehow solve the constraints, and you get some initial values for gamma ij and kij at time zero. You then choose uh, the coordinate functions alpha and beta. And now we have everything specified that is on the right-hand side of the evolution equations. So we can now take the computer and evolve gamma ij and kij forward in time. Okay, yeah, except the constraint equations, these ones here, that you need to solve at time equals zero, they are of no known mathematical type as of yet, as I've written them down up here. So yes, in principle, it should be possible to, to have solutions, but it's not easy to find them because if you look in math books, nothing there tells you how to solve these equations. Second, how do you choose coordinates 
if we don't know what was going to happen. Third, these evolution equations I was sketching out for you up here, they are not well posed. That means if you put them on a computer, they will fail. Okay, so I've now twice used the word mathematical type and well posed. And let's briefly go into differential equations and remind you of the two basic types. One are elliptic equations, like the Laplace equation for some scalar u as a function of space. Uh, elliptic equations are function of space only, so you have some spatial domain omega. You need one boundary condition on each boundary of omega. Could be Dirichlet, could be von Neumann, could be asymptotic falloff, doesn't matter. And once you have one boundary condition on every boundary of your domain, then you save all, solve the full equation all at once without any intermediate steps. The second important type of equations is called hyperbolic equation, with the prototype being the wave equation, d by dd squared of u of x and t minus spatial gradient squared of u equals some source function. So this is the wave equation. It's a function of space and time, u of x and t. And so what you're having is you have a spatial domain, omega down here, and then you have a time axis going up. And what one needs to solve these type of hyperbolic equations is one needs two initial conditions at t0, uh, the values and the first derivatives. In order to start up, and one needs boundary conditions on any time-like boundaries that go up here. So this side here of, of the of the of the evolved volume, for instance, and all the other sides of the evolved volumes. This is where one needs boundary conditions. And one has no boundary whatsoever at time t2. The important part of, of hyperbolic equations is that the future follows from the current state. You have initial conditions at t0, and it will tell you what's going to happen later on. And in particular, it will tell you what happens at capital T1. So these are evolution equations where you start at some early time and you can evolve towards later times. And now the next goal of, uh, of the formalism of GR is to actually turn uh, what are the ADM equation into um, well-defined elliptic and hyperbolic equations for evolutions. Um, the constraints are the simpler things to do. So let's look at the constraints first. And the fundamental strategy is to use potentials to isolate uh, the right number of degrees of freedom. It turns out what's extremely useful is a conformal transformation where one writes the spatial metric gamma ij as a conformal factor that is assumed to be positive everywhere times a conformal metric. Now the word conformal comes about because this type of transformation doesn't change angles, therefore the word conformal. With this conformal metric gamma tilde, we have yet another complete differential geometry. We can combine, uh, define everything again based on this gamma tilde, a inverse metric gamma tilde, 
Christopher symbols from gamma tilde, uh, covariant derivatives of gamma tilde, curvatures defined from gamma tilde, the whole thing. And if you do so, you can show that the three-dimensional scalar curvature of the full space-time of the full metric gamma, so this is the thing coming from gamma, is equal to certain functions of gamma tilde. It turns out this one term that just has the scalar curvature of gamma tilde, and there is one term that has the Laplacian of psi built in. If you look back at the Hamiltonian constraint, wherever it was, it had a term free scalar curvature built put in. And this free scalar curvature now turns into a where are we? This free scalar curvature now turns into a Laplacian on psi. If you rearrange term solving for the Laplacian of psi, what you'll find is the Laplacian of psi um, plus extra terms. There's an R tilde term coming from right here. And there are KIJ terms coming from the rest of the Hamiltonian constraint further. The few point now taken is that given gamma IJ, we now have a nice elliptic equation for psi with the nice Laplacian as one of the terms. So the few point for solving the constraints, one of the few points is we write the full spatial metric that we want as a as of yet unknown function psi times some other metric gamma tilde. We choose that other metric gamma tilde in some way. And then the Hamiltonian constraint will tell us what the function psi is. So we've managed to turn the Hamiltonian constraint into something nice. And as a side remark, we can now already do a lot of cool stuff. Let's make the simplest possible assumptions, vacuum, and let's set kij zero, zero expensive curvature. It turns out the momentum constraint is now completely solved. We are done there. And it turns out the Hamiltonian constraint uh, loses the kij terms and loses the right-hand side. So it also gets simpler. It turns into a already quite simple looking equation. And let's also make the next totally simplistic assumption you can do. And let's assume that this metric gamma tilde is just flat space, Euclidean space. If you had x, y, z coordinates, it would be given by a Kronecker delta function. If you are in spherical coordinates, it would be given by uh, a diagonal metric, d r squared plus r squared d theta squared plus r squared sine squared theta d phi squared. If you do this, well, the Laplacian turns into the flat space Laplacian. And the R tilde becomes zero. So what we now have to solve is just the flat space Laplace equation. And that is solved, for instance, by constants, or it is solved by functions that go like one over r. Picking the constant such that at large distance, psi becomes one, uh, the, the conformal metric and the physical metric both become unit metrics. Um, 
What we have now is a spatial metric that is given by our conformal factor, m over 2r plus 1 to the fourth, times the usual flat space metric. And this is now already the Schwarzschild solution, a Schwarzschild black hole, in a specific set of coordinates that is called isotropic coordinates. So the formulas I have described to you can already construct Schwarzschild black holes. But we can do better. We can now take two terms here, both are decaying like 1 over r, but they have different centers, C1 and C2, and they have different coefficients, M1 and M2. This function psi, combined with the flat space metric again, is now giving us two black holes at the locations C1 and C2, two black holes at rest. So with remarkable little work, we could work out how to get initial conditions that actually correspond to one black hole, two black holes, or a lot more black holes. There's a similar decomposition for the extrinsic curvature. Turns out setting it to zero is not the, the best thing you can do. Because if you set it to zero, you can only get black holes at rest. Um, you can also play quite nice games with the extrinsic curvature uh, using more nice conditions that make things quite easy looking. And at the end of the day, once you do this, you end up with um, another elliptic equation for some vector v. Um, that shows up in the extrinsic curvature. And so we have the situation that the momentum constraint turns into three elliptic equations for this vector vi. And the Hamiltonian constraint turns into one elliptic equation for psi. And so the, the overall strategy becomes to first choose whatever the pieces are that show up in the right-hand side of these elliptic equations. I, talk, I talked about the gamma delta. And in the momentum constraint, you have two more things showing up, k and a i j t t. You have to choose boundary conditions on your elliptic equations that enforce you actually get black holes. And then one can solve these two sets of equations here, these four equations, three plus one, for uh, psi and vi. And then one can assemble the full initial data, the full gamma IJ and the full K IJ. And at that point, one is done with constructing initial conditions. Um, there's more to this game, both in terms of simplifying it again. The nice thing to simplify it is that there are analytic solutions for this VI functions that work fairly well. And that lead to the so-called puncture initial data. This is multi black holes, boosted spinning black holes. And the biggest downside of the puncture initial data is that the maximum possible spin is only about 0.9. So below 0.9, Certainly below 0.8, puncture initial data is really great. Above 0.9, you need to do more complicated things. You really need to, to solve the V equation as well. You can't get away with the analytic solution. And you need to be, put more effort into boundary conditions, and then you can get up to spins as, as high as basically you wish. That goes under the name of conformal sandwich, but I will skip over it. Um, 
in to save a few minutes of time. So the initial value equations we've now dealt with. We've turned them into equations where tomorrow and on Wednesday I'm telling you how to solve. Now what can we do with the evolution equations? I've spelled out here the, the structure of the ADM equations again. We have the time derivative of the spatial metric gamma ij, and that basically has the kij on the right hand side. That is fine. And then there's the time derivative of the kij that has basically the Ricci tensor on the right hand side. If one looks at the terms that are in the Ricci tensor, one finds three different pieces. One is a wave operator, a certain combination of second derivatives of, of gamma i chain. That wave operator is absolutely no problem. Uh, wave equations are the prototypical hyperbolic equations. There's a lot of literature how to solve them. That would be nice and no problem whatsoever. Then there are a lot of terms, I'm just schematically calling them gamma gamma. They are lower order. They don't have second derivatives in, it at, as in, in them at all. They are also fine because lower order terms do not impact the mathematical structure of equations. And then in the middle here is the nasty stuff. There's one extra term, a partial derivative of certain Christoffel symbols. The Christoffel symbols have already first derivatives of the metric. And so here we also have second derivatives of the metric. And those are the nasty derivatives that actually destroy hyperbolicity. And recognizing that these middle terms are evil was one of the big accomplishments in the 1990s and early 2000s that made it later on possible to solve Einstein equations. So we have an equation that we want to solve that is given to us, Einstein equations. That's the equation we want to solve. But it has evil terms. What can one do? There's three basic strategies that have been combined here. One is to change evolution variables. It turns out, the mathematical structure of equations depends on what variables to write them in. So for instance, one of the things that's being done is that the full gamma ij is being split back into a conformal metric, gamma bar ij, and a conformal factor e to the 4 phi. I'm now using the, the nomenclature that is more commonly used in the evolution equation, but the gamma bar is just the gamma tilde I had earlier, and the phi is basically the psi I had earlier. So you, you can make the split, and you then end up with equations for gamma bar and for phi. And it turns out it does matter whether you make this type of split or not. The second trick one can do is one can add multiples of the Hamiltonian and the momentum constraint. Um, the Hamiltonian and the momentum constraint themselves have second derivatives built in, second spatial derivatives, wherever I have them. So here's the, there is a three scalar curvature in the Hamiltonian constraint, and there's a gradient of the extrinsic curvature in the momentum constraint. So the constraints are supposed to be satisfied, so they're just zero, 
we can add them to the evolution equation, and this will change what partial derivatives are on the right-hand side of the evolution equations. And this can be used to get rid of some of the bad terms. And finally, one can introduce dummy variables. So I've told you the gamma is a nasty thing. Well, let's just call the gamma a new variable in our evolution equations. If we do this, the gamma still shows up in some evolution equation, like here, but because gamma itself is now an evolved variable, what we have here is now only first derivatives of the evolved variables. Whereas up here, we had second derivatives of the evolved variables. Because up here, the gamma IJ was the evolved variable. And capital gamma had a first derivative. And here comes the second derivative in front of it. So, by this trick of introducing dummy variables, one can actually reduce the differential order of terms in the equation. Of course, then one also has to figure out what the evolution equations are for these dummy variables. And finding those uh, was also was one of the big steps that was going on in the 90s as well. And this, at the end of the day, led to the so-called PSSN equations uh, that can be written in this form schematically. Um, the SN are Shibata and Nakamura, who got most of the way there in 95, and then Baumgarde and Shapiro put in the last pieces in 98 for the set of equations that is still being used to solve Einstein's equations. And this set of equation underlies the moving puncture evolutions. The second approach being done. Uh, Harald, there is a, a couple of questions. Maybe the first one, the second one is uh, of immediate uh, interest. It is where the gauge curve parameters alpha and beta are mapped to when we rewrote the uh -huh. equations using the conformal that's, that's an absolute, That's a very, very good question. They still hang around here on the right hand side of all these equations. And they come back into a slide that I took out earlier um, when I was preparing slides because I felt I was running out of time because this is now combined. So the, the alphas and betas are still floating around here on the right hand side. They haven't been removed yet. But this is now combined with what's called the moving puncture gauge. That basically tells you that basically tells you the time derivatives of the alpha and betas. So the, the alpha and betas are still there, and there are extra evolution equations to, that determines how they change as a function of time. The other question I see, already 10 minutes ago, apologize, apologies for overlooking it. Um, is it possible to have a solution consistent with GR where the two black holes are at rest? Um, the answer is yes, kind of. For generic, plain, usual astrophysical realistic systems, no, it doesn't happen. <laughs> 
always gravitational wave emission is driving the system towards merger because there is no stationary state where any force can balance the attractive force of gravity. So without a track, the only way in astrophysical situation where you have to balance the, the gravitational force of gravity is by putting centrifugal forces in rotation. But once you have rotation, you get gravitational waves and that ultimately leads to merger. Where things can get to work in astrophysically not relevant cases is when you have black holes with extremal charge. So you have, say, Reisner Nordstrom black holes, non spinning, but you put on as much charge as you can to just barely are, be at the threshold of, of naked singularities. If you take two such black holes, each one with the maximum allowed positive charge, it turns out the charge just barely manages to balance the gravity. And this would be a situation where you have two black holes at rest. However, any whatsoever slight perturbation um, will perturb the black holes such that uh, this, this, the equilibrium disappears and the black holes will either be driven away from each other or collapse down to one black hole. Also, such immensely strong large charges are unstable to pair decay. So there's such a strong electric field around the black holes that electrons and positrons will just form spontaneously in the electric field. Uh, the one that has the opposite charge of the black hole will fall into the black hole and reduce the charge of the black hole. The other one will go to infinity. And that way the charge of the black hole is reduced and then the black hole's gravity will take over and then will fall together. Harald, there is one more question from uh, Abhishek. Uh, so how do we know that the initial data actually contains a black hole and not a coordinate singularity? Excellent question. Where was that question? I don't see it. This came in private to me. I think he's- Oh, okay. Um, the way to find this out is by either, you can either, you can do two things. You basically, I've written this down very briefly and didn't go into it. You choose the boundary conditions when solving the initial data to enforce the half black holes present. Um, in one formalism for setting initial data, you actually have an extended inner boundary Uh, which is spherical, and you set as the boundary condition, it must equal a horizon. It turns out this turns into a valid boundary condition, which in turn, by its mere presence of the boundary condition, will force a black hole to be there. The second trick is to use the, wherever is it, to use the asymptotic form of this psi function. It turns out that behavior of psi that goes like one over r, this is a Einstein-Rosen bridge. And this again implies that you must have a black hole. So it, the black holes are already smartly put into the formalism. And then afterwards, after you have constructed your initial data, you can use apparent horizon finders to actually double check that you really have them. <laughs> 
If I may go over time for another 10 minutes, I would like to also uh, discuss the other way of solving the Einstein evolution problem, the so-called Schwarz harmonic equations. Here the idea is to stay four dimensional. So we start, we start with the four dimensional Einstein equations. Um, they have the same structure as just indicated above. There's a nice wave operator. That's fine. They have lower order terms. That's fine. They have the same nasty intermediate Christoffel symbols that make everything not fine at all. In this four dimensional approach, the important trick to notice is that these Christoffel symbols that show up here are actually related to the coordinates themselves. It turns out the Christoffel symbols <coughs> are certain second derivatives of the, of the coordinates. And so the old trick coming back more than 100 years already is to choose coordinates such that this thing here is identically zero. If you assume you have coordinates where that satisfy this condition, well, then the gammas are zero. And then this whole nasty term is gone. So far, so good. This works very well for post-Newtonian calculation but it fails near merger for black holes um, because you develop coordinate singularities. So the trick is to not require the full zero, but to put some functions on the right hand side where these functions do not have derivatives of the metric. Without derivatives of the metric, um, the gamma, which is equal to the h, will not have derivatives of the metric. And so we have this extra derivative in front of it. But this now will only have first derivatives of h which are first derivatives of the metric itself and not second derivatives of the metric. And so that's where the nice thing comes in. Beforehand, the gradient of the Christoffel had the second derivatives of the metric, but by requiring that H doesn't have derivatives of the metric itself, um, we're only ending up with derivatives of H, which has only first derivatives of metric and not second. At that point, the H turns into lower order terms. And one has equations that have a wave operator at second order, second order derivatives, and everything else being nice lower order. So at this point, we have this equation here up to there. That's not an equation that is well posed. It can be solved on computers. It has a nice wave operator as principal part. All of that is good. However, the next problem now arises. And this is again related to constraints. We have simplified the equations by substituting derivatives of gamma with derivatives of h. That made the equations mathematically nice. However, that replacement is only allowed if gamma and h are identical. If the difference is zero, 
And it, there's nothing in the evolution equations now that forces this difference to remain zero, unfortunately. So, if I'm calling this different difference C for constraint, it turns out if you only have the short set of equations here, then unfortunately the C are going to ex uh, increase exponentially. And after a very, very brief time, the coordinates that you actually have in the simulation uh, as given by the gammas are widely different from the coordinates that you wanted to have as given by the choice of H. So bad luck doesn't work. And this is where constraint damping comes in. And the trick here is to add yet more terms to the evolution equation entirely by hand. Namely, this last part here is just being added to the evolution equation without That term was chosen very carefully in, to satisfy two conditions. The first one is quite simple to describe. If the constraints are zero, we do not want to change Einstein equations. Well, this manifests itself in that both terms that I'm, I'm spelling out here are proportional to the constraints themselves. So if the constraints are satisfied, this whole green box is going to be zero, and we are still solving the nice yellow Einstein equations without modifications. If, however, the constraints are non-zero, then this new term was chosen very carefully such that the time derivative of the constraints is now decaying roughly exponentially with roughly a speed of this coefficient here in front that is a freely specifiable function. So the system now behaves as follows. We start at time equals zero. The constraints are satisfied. However, within the first numerical time step, small numerical errors will creep in and make the constraints ever so, so slightly non-zero. If we only had the yellow equations, those very small non-zero constraint violations would increase exponentially and the simulation would die very quickly. However, the new green terms will force the small constraint violations to decay exponentially and just remain on the very, very small level throughout. This is called constraint damping, as I'm writing down the last line. And it was proposed by Gundlach for generalized harmonic. And it was the last trick that Praetorius needed to get his evolution system working with the generalized harmonic equations. And I'm sure there's a, a question coming up if I don't tell you, so let me tell you right away. Plus, you still need alpha and beta. Uh, the coordinate freedom is still there, and you still need to find good conditions for alpha and, and beta in order to make it work. Um, those conditions are mostly a work of trial and error, uh, like they were up here. Here as well, these were basically derived off by trial and error. And if you pick the right ones, it works. If you don't pick the right ones, it fails. Um, the depth of understanding of what gauge conditions are good is still very minimal and I think will be a nice area to work on 
and the interface between analytical and numerical results in the future. And I think I have much overstayed my, my welcome here. I thank you very much for the attention and staying with me. I apologize for running over time. And um, of course, I'm still happy to take more questions if you have them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Harald, for this very nice introduction to the mathematical formulation. So I, I see them questions already coming up uh, in the chat box. Um, okay, okay, okay. Yes, there are motivations for one, how one chooses gauge conditions. And they are basically worked by trying to avoid uh, coordinate singularities. So this is the nice thing about having a, a piece of paper here. Hey, hey, I can just make a new piece of paper. Hopefully at the end. Yes, here it is. Um, we basically start out with wanting to avoid, say, you want the spatial metric to be approximately constant. And so it turns out if you, if you look at certain derivatives, If you take the, the time derivative of the spatial metric, uh, this is related to a Laplacian acting on the shift vector. And so by wanting to say, say, um, you want a zero time derivative of the metric or certain pieces of the metric uh, that gives you a certain condition for, for the shift vectors. And since elliptic equations are difficult, you take now this equation and you turn it into a, some evolution equation that where you say d by dt of, of beta i equals kind of minus gradient squared of beta i plus dot dot dot, where this equation basically ends up here on the right hand side. So you, you are going through motivational steps, typically starting from, I want the metric to be as constant as I can, that lead you to some type of equations. And then you, these equations are being modified with um, tons of coefficients. until everything turns out to be working. So you put coefficients. Gamma is a bad choice for coefficient here. Uh, you could put some, some coefficients, let's call them A, A beta here, which can be some functions of many different things. And you have more coefficients B in, in the other term. And those coefficients are then the ones that are determined by trial and error. Another question is about the advantages, disadvantages of, of the two evolution systems I've written down here. Um, both are in use. The BSSN equations are being used by more groups um, because they are easier to implement and because they still give alpha and beta directly as uh, free variables. So it's much easier to in interpret what your gauge conditions actually might mean. In generalized harmonic, the gauge freedom is hidden in these H functions. And these H functions are, roughly speaking, the time derivatives of la lapse and shift. So there's still a relation to lapse and shift, but it's much less direct. And so it's more difficult to choose good gauge source functions and still get the evolution to do what you want. The big advantage of generalized harmonic is the fact that you have a wave operator. That generalized harmonic is at the end of the day, 
a wave operator, just a set of wave equations, and that makes boundary conditions very easy. That makes um, deep mathematical understanding of the equations quite easy. It also makes the spectral methods possible. It turns out spectral methods are very sensitive to having to the mathematical structure of the equations. And for reasons I'm going to explain tomorrow, the fact that you have a very simple wave operator here is crucial for internal interdomain boundary condition, interelement. Um, and this, this is where we in the SXX collaboration come in and use spectral methods on, on generalized harmonic because we are explore, exploring the simple wave operator when setting boundary conditions and the, both internally and at a large distance. In the BSSN wave system, setting of boundary conditions is a lot more ad hoc and not well motivated mathematically at all. There's a question about why the double derivatives of the metric are troubling and affect hyperbolicity. I will go into this tomorrow and show you a, a little example of just a two by two set of ordinary differential equations that you cannot solve on a computer. And that will clarify what the difficulty is. So please wait until tomorrow. There is a hand up from Apritim and then Ajit Mehta. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the nice lecture. So my uh, question is regarding this transformation from the ADM to the BSSM. Say for GR, as you mentioned, that there is this three steps which are involved. Uh, can you, uh, for first question is, can you um, explain the second step? The second is what I understood is um, it involves a lot of intuition. Now, if you have uh, some alternative theories of gravity and then you're considering uh, BSS and equations, then you might, uh, it might uh, turn out that uh, they are not, they don't, uh, the equations, uh, the evolution equations are not strongly hyperbolic. But is there a way if, if, if the theory is like a, um, you can get a perturb uh, perturbation from GR, then is it a way that we can perturbatively get some uh, conditions to uh, get uh, strongly hyperbolic equations for this theories. Thank you. So the, the important part, and this also applies to the one question typed into the chat window, the important part is that the highest derivatives um, determine hyperbolicity. And to answer the simple question first, if, if I have an equation that's the one in the chat window, why does adding constraints actually make a difference? If you have an equation like um, so d by dt gamma ij had a Ricci tensor on the right hand side, if we take the trace here, what we get basically is d by dt of phi equals trace of the Ricci tensor. So phi is roughly speaking the determinant of gamma ij, uh, or it is, or rather e to the four phi is determinant of gamma ij, uh, as it is for BSSN. Then if you take this equation down here and you begin adding constraints, so the Hamiltonian constraint was basically um, free Ricci plus Kij squared 
equals zero. If you now substitute, if you now um, If you're now uh, subtracting the Hamiltonian constraint, what used to be a three Ricci tensor can be eliminated and can be replaced, for instance, by squares of extrinsic curvature terms. So you can, you can because the, the constraints also contain the highest derivatives in various combinations, you can use them to affect the highest derivative terms in the evolution equations. So, why is this now also important for the question about alternative gravity? And that now totally depends on what the evolution equations are for, for your alternative theories. Um, if you have something like scalar tensor, basically GR, plus scalars and tensor fields, extra fields, this typically doesn't change the, the principal parts. And the principal parts being the same is what's nice. If you, however, have a, a scalar, an alternative theory where you're changing GR itself, GR prime, for instance, you do something like you have a Lagrangian that not only has um, the Ricci term, but it has some, some extra things uh, like you reach the curvature squared terms, then you are changing the highest order derivative terms. And then you have to redo all the work that went into Einstein's equations in terms of the hyperbolicity analysis and all the trial and error that went into the BSSN and Chernoistomonic equations. And so, once you get to this modified theories of gravity where the actual metric equations change, there's a lot of work uh, in redoing all the formalism. And so far, we don't have the community has not yet accomplished this even for a single alternative theory of gravity. It took 20, 30 years for gravity for GR. We are now smarter than we were 20 or 30 years ago, but still you have to go through the whole sequence of steps that took many decades for GR, for every single alternative theory of gravity uh, where you want to do this. Um, Harold, sorry. Uh, what I wanted to say is, I understand, like when you're going from, say, R to R, adding an R squared term, so you're, what you're saying is you're increasing from a second order to a fourth order differential equations. But also, uh, such, such kind of theories have also been looked perturbatively. Um, if that, in, in those cases, uh, uh, will, uh, will the situation, uh, like how, how to go for, for, to look for a strongly hyperbolic set of equations, uh, will that be an easier approach? Uh, easier to look like. Is there a perturbative approach approach for that also from BSS and formalism? So if if you do this perturbatively, so what I, I've spelled out here is, is the full nonlinear case. If you do it perturbatively, you end up in basically the the GR principle term and some perturbations that usually turn into scalar or tensor perturbations. In this case, you are in the nice regime where just solving what you've done before, plus, well, a large number of extra scalar and tensor fields, 
And this is why this has been done, because the principal term parts are unchanged. And in principle, I, I, I don't see any reason why BSSN should be better or worse than Charles Harmonic for this. Uh, at this point, it depends wholly on what code you are familiar with, because you would be using the code you already know to make these changes. Uh, okay, uh, and there's just last question where you have the, when you have the when you because you said that the th if the theory is what order so if you have a Gauss body term then it's it, you have still like um, a, a second order equation so then are you saying that then it it is fine so with Gauss body you still have a second order equation but then you also need to go it has different principal parts from just plain old gr. And only earlier this year has the first proof appeared that gauss bonnet is actually hyperbolic. And this is so far still a very mathematical proof, which so far has not yet turned into uh, any numerical work. So, yes, gauss bonnet is better in the sense that at least to have second order uh, equations, but still you have to redo the whole sequence of, of work that has been done for GR. You have GR as a guidance, but it's, it's non-trivial work. Okay, thanks. Okay, Ajit has a next question. Uh, hi, Rad. Um, maybe you said it, I missed it. Um, in three plus one approach, when we were solving the initial conditions, can you go to that particular slide? The mathematical trick or whatever this conformal trick. Uh, how, can you explain a little bit more? Like, I mean, in principle, we need to know gamma ij, which is a special metric, into a special metric which might have, I think, six independent component or whatever, but now we just are working with only psi of x, which is just one function. I mean, uh, if you choose like gamma ij, like uh, eta ij, like etc. I mean, yes. okay, you understood the question? Uh, no. Uh, so, so, so I'm then asking, so in principle, one needed to know six components, but now actually it had reduced to just understand solving for psi, right? If you mm -hmm. choose, uh, gamma ij equals to eta ij, which uh, reproduced basically Schwarzschild equation. I just wanted to understand basically uh, the physical meaning, how this solved the problem, where, how did this trick work? We, we could have, I mean, we wanted to knew, we wanted to know gamma ij and then suddenly you chose this conformal trick where gamma ij, eta ij, and then you just solved it. Like, I just <laughs> want to understand how did, Okay, so the, what we want is gamma ij and kij. So these are 12 functions, 6 and 6, because both are symmetric. We have a Hamiltonian and a momentum constraint, which is 1 and 3 functions, 1 and 3 conditions. So we should have eight left. Right, right. And now what we are doing for this very simple case is we are basically taking a subset of the equations by setting kij equals zero. We only are left with a choice for gamma that has to satisfy the Hamiltonian constraint. And so we have, at that point, we have six, six quantities that we want to construct and one condition on them. Um, we split the six into one in Psi and five in the conformal metric because the determinant doesn't matter. We could have said the determinant of gamma ij is one to fix the sixth degree of freedom in gamma tilde. And then what remains is the Hamiltonian constraint is going to, the, to constrain the one constraint, sorry. And the rest, the five, 
are freely specifiable. And what you choose there um, will depend on the physical situation one is interested in. Sometimes the really simple, let's choose a flat metric is good enough. It gives us Schwarzschild space times. Um, if you want orbiting and rotating black holes, then you need to make smarter choices there, which I didn't get into. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So thank you very much, uh, Harald, for this uh, wonderful lecture. And we look forward to hearing the next one tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much.